All right, so I talked to you about OpenMDAO. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about my, my other child, uh, Dimos. Um, so Dimos is actually what brought me into the OpenMDAO world around 2015. I had uh, worked with uh, OpenMDAO's predecessor, uh, which was called Otis, which is like a 40-year-old, uh, started as an industry legacy tool. In the 90s, uh, Glenn Research Center took it over and started using it uh, to do launch vehicle optimization. Um, the alternative, like we had Dimos, or sorry, we had o Otis, and then we had another tool that was, was all uh, hardcore Euler Lagrange theory, co-states and all kinds of stuff like that. And I've just heard horror stories about, you know, if you guys don't like derivatives, then the derivatives that they were defining for that and changing whenever, you know, a certain constraint on the launch changed just sounds like a, a nightmare. So, so Dimos came out of that. <clears throat> um, uh, let's see, we've been, been making solid progress. This year, uh, the release cycle for Dimos hasn't been quite as rapid as that of OpenMDO. With OpenMDO, we try to maintain about one release a month. Dimos, we just released the latest version, uh, uh, 1.6, which was uh, the first one since May. Um, Dimos is being used at NASA to define uh, our design our next generation of aircraft design tools. Uh, so we have a, a capability that we're developing here called Aviary. Uh, Aviary is is basically our, our attempt to put uh, modern air aircraft design practices uh, in the hands of, of people. Um, uh, open open source, so uh, we're we're working on that now. Uh, that's being led by my colleague uh, Jennifer Gratz over, over there. <clears throat> um, it's pushing us uh, in in certain development efforts. Um, we're working on getting our performance up as ever. Uh, we're working on training because thinking of of dynamic systems. Uh, with a simple integration, with a simple time-stepping ODE is a little bit different than the way you have to think about it when you use something like Dimos. And uh, also other capabilities, uh, one that we just added is analytic phases. Uh, we're using uh, Dimos for spacecraft attitude optimization. Uh, my, my colleague uh, uh, Brad is here and uh, he has a really uh, interesting model of, uh, you know, we, t we take a three-doff reference trajectory for a spacecraft, uh, we, we, you know, throw it through its its trip to wherever it's going. I think this one was uh, uh, one of our efforts to go to the moon. Uh, but we need to, to define the reaction wheel system and, and, and everything like that, even though most of our uh, legacy, or not even legacy, but most of our state-of-the-art uh, spacecraft trajectory optimization tools are three off. So we want to know what the reaction wheels are doing and things like that. Uh, so, so Brad's made a, a pretty amazing model in, in SimPy that starts from first principles and says, okay, if I'm going to, you know, if the vehicle needs to point this way, this is the way I need to, to, be, to be torquing my reaction wheels. Um, and we've been working on a model in, in getting that to, to converge uh, with Dimos, which is, like I said, this is what was driving a lot of the SimPy stuff that I was talking about earlier, where, you know, very complex models in SimPy and leveraging SimPy to say, hey, you know, <laughs> You, you have this equation at the end of the day, spit out, you know, 30 lines worth of derivatives for me. Uh, and it's, uh, that aspect's been, uh, it's been very performant and, and really great. It also uh, highlights some of the issues that, that we see in automatic differentiation. And, and frankly, one of the reasons OpenMDO exists is because those automatic differentiation tools aren't necessarily smart. Uh, so they, they don't necessarily write the most efficient uh, derivatives code when they're done. Um, but that is both a bit on them and a bit on us and, and just being uh, naive users essentially of SimPy and, and being relatively new to the tool. So uh, interesting things going on there. That's a fairly large model with 14 state variables, uh, 49 inputs, uh, 52 uh, constant inputs that we provide via options. And then when we are defining our partials, uh, it defines 196 uh, partial uh, derivatives equations in that component. So this is definitely not something that you would want to be doing uh, manually. Uh, so, and, and like I said, as far as, as far as tackling some of the inefficiency that's in SimPy, uh, we need to use, uh, if, if you're using SimPy, uh, try out their uh, common, uh, common uh, sub-expression uh, elimination. That, that matters a lot. Some of the derivative equations that we're getting out of SimPy call the sign of a, a, you know, of a certain angle a thousand times. And <laughs> just, uh, 
it's, it's not doing it the most intelligent way possible uh, when you use it in the naive case. So just as before with OpenMDO, where we kind of went through what we've been doing recently, things that we've been doing in Dimos recently. Uh, uh, Tad uh, built uh, something like this. If you look at that, it looks a lot like an N2. Uh, although it's, it's sort of like a Dymo specific N2. This tells you how continuity flows uh, in your variables uh, in your model. Uh, it's easy to build up a, a many phase trajectory and forget to link two phases together and, and have it come up with something you know, that w where you know, a, uh, a mass is discontinuous or something like that between two phases. So we've already gotten really good feedback on this, that this is helping and there's a few, uh, f few changes that we can make to make it a little bit better, but it's been very useful. Um, and this, this leverages the existing OpenMDO report system. Uh, so it's, it's one of the, it's, it's the first thing, first report that we've built outside of OpenMDAO uh, that, that uses that system that just automatically builds it for the user. Uh, here, here it is uh, with the, the race car problem. So the race car problem, or I don't know if any of you are familiar with trajectory optimization, there's something uh, called dynamic soaring where it's basically, I, I, wanna, I wanna take a single lap and, and end up at the same condition I was before, I just want that lap to be as fast as possible. So it's sort of an interesting case where your, your final state of your trajectory is continuous with the initial state of your trajectory. Dymos handles that fine and, and the linkage report here helps you visualize it and make, it, make, sure, that you, uh, make sure that you did things right. Uh, the linkage report will kind of yell at you. It'll, it'll uh, highlight things in red if you've tried to link things that are constrained. So say at the end of one phase, I have one quantity that's fixed in the beginning of next phase. Uh, that quantity is also fixed. If I tell them to be continuous, I'm over constrained. That's a situation that a lot of people accidentally find themselves in. Um, but the, uh, uh, the report helps, helps you recognize that uh, pretty quickly. Uh, thing that we're currently working on, uh, and this, this comes out of uh, kind of a carryover from the legacy tool that we base ourselves on, are uh, time, series and, uh, time series and constraints uh, that are based on expressions. So it's, it's uh, when you build a model for Dimos, you can have quite a complicated uh, ODE system that defines how your states evolve, defines all the ancillary calculations that you wanna perform, uh, things that you'd like to constrain but it's also really likely that you wanna have some mathematical expression, you know, uh, you know, my model doesn't compute this and I wanna constrain it. Uh, in this day and age where, where we get models from other people and we wanna exercise them, maybe I don't feel comfortable in, in adding my code to their model. I don't wanna to have to worry about con committing, committing these changes back just so I can constrain a certain quantity. So uh, we have the, the exec comp in OpenMDO that lets me define an, an equation and compute derivatives for it uh, with complex step, makes things really simple. But to be able to do that in Dimos and say, oh hey, you know, I've been computing these things already. They exist either as states or controls in my model or outputs of the ODE. Let's define a function up based on those and then either path constrain that or boundary constrain that, or in general just add it to the time series so I can see how that quantity is evolving. Uh, that's something that, uh, that we're working on and we hope to release here in the next few weeks. Uh, shooting methods. Uh, so the strength of Dimos are the implicit trajectory optimization methods that it employs, uh, which are great, but also by default require that you essentially make sure that your physics are accurate by applying a, an optimizer uh, to the model and, and essentially uh, imposing the con uh, physical constraints as as, as uh, constraints on the optimizer. Not everybody wants to do that, understandably so. Uh, again, like I said, the notion of evaluating all of your points in time is foreign to some people. They tend to, to run uh, uh, trajectory simulation in a way where you know, they assume that they knew the quantities coming out of the, out of the previous time step. Um, we do have the notion of simulate uh, in Dimos. The, the purpose of simulate is to take your control history and say, okay, I optimize this trajectory. This is what Dymo says is my optimal control history. Uh, is that real? And, and that might not be real based on uh, the, the density of the grid in which we're looking at the problem. So the purpose of simulate is to, to essentially smoothly interpolate those controls, bottle up my ODE into something that, that SciPy uh, solve IVP can, can analyze and propagate that through forward in time. And that's great for checking and verifying uh, that the solution that Dymos found uh, was in fact a physically valid solution. 
Uh, the problem with that solution is that it doesn't propagate derivatives. There are ways we could propagate derivatives through that, uh, but I'm not sure that's the, the, the best way to do it, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we also have the option of solve segments where, you know, we have open MDAO, it's really easy to task a Newton solver to do something for me. So instead of posing those constraints, uh, uh, the collocation defect constraints that make sure that our physics are, are satisfied, uh, you know, we can, we can ask a Newton solver to do those. And in a lot of ways that has the, the behavior of, of something uh, like a, a fixed step propagator where I'm gonna say from left to right, go through here, satisfy my, my uh, equations of motion as we go, and when you're done satisfying the equations of motion, then give any additional constraints that we have like boundary constraints or path constraints to the optimizer. Um, it slows things down a little bit, but at the end of the day, you also get something that, that, that satisfies physics with only a call to run model and not requiring on, on having the scaling and everything right on the optimization side. So explicit shooting methods. Uh, we have an explicit shooting uh, transcription. It's a little bit experimental. I, I know my colleague Kashik's been, been uh, working on it and fixing a few things uh, that we missed in it. The purpose of explicit shooting is to do exactly uh, what it says. When, when you solve trajectory optimization problems, what you're really doing is you're looking for a continuous control variables uh, solution. And to do that, we generally uh, dis discretize the problem and say, okay, instead of finding a continuous function, I just wanna find the values of that function at various points. Um, the pseudo-spectral methods I mentioned are kind of the bread and butter of, of DIMOS and, and the way that it mainly does that. Uh, but explicit shooting is also an option where I can, you know, wanna be able to say, if I start at, at this state condition and, and have this, these control histories, where do I end up? An explicit shooting will do that and it will propagate derivatives uh, through it unlike, unlike uh, the solve IVP case. Um, I'm eager to talk about anyone who's interested in this and wants to nerd out with me later, we can talk about ways to propagate derivatives uh, through shooting methods. But explicit shooting methods uh, do it a little bit differently than, than some of uh, the literature cases. Um, but, uh, and, it, and it works fine, it's just, uh, similar to what I would argue that is a problem with this even in the existing literature is that if you want to use variable step methods, uh, the changing of your time step is actually going to impact the path that your uh, uh, derivatives take of your partial derivatives and you're not necessarily going to get good accuracy out of that. And there's some publication out there that kind of supports that fact. Um, so we're working on that and seeing if we can come up with a better way to do explicit shooting. Uh, problems with explicit shooting, while it's great that, that you don't have convergence issues because it's just kind of, you know, if I say to use this time step and tell me where you end up, that's where it's going to end up. If that's not physically valid because my time step was too large, I don't care. I get derivatives for, for the path that I requested and not for the, the you know, uh, the path as it should be. So it makes the optimizer happy. Um, it is significantly slower than the pseudo-spectral methods just because I am evaluating, uh, evaluating the equations of motion a lot more points. There's effectively a for loop in under there and as Justin mentioned early, earlier, uh, for loops are the bane of existence for Python and we, we try to avoid those wherever we can. Uh, shooting methods also tend to get stuck in, in the design space in, in local optima and I know I, I hear, you know, I hear people always wanna say, oh, I wanna find a, the global optima, not the local optima. I will, I will argue with that also because I, to, me, to me the global methods are like, sure, you can find the global optimum, but I can't promise you that it's not going to take you know, the age of the universe to do that. So there's always those issues. Um, and, then, uh, and then the last point there is again, uh, there is sort of a gridding issue with the explicit shooting methods, which is you know, what adaptive step was, was made to solve as far as, as, far as uh, simulation goes. But adaptive step might have issues um, with derivatives. Uh, another one, this, is, this just came out with the most recent release, analytic phases. Um, so uh, this was driven by a d design case uh, for the aviary software. Uh, what, if, what if I happen to know the analytic solution to the integration throughout this time? Why waste uh, the optimizer's effort in, in trying to find that solution if I can just essentially provide an open MDO component that says at any given time, here's, here's what the state variable is going to be based on your initial state. Um, so some examples where you could use this in, in practice, two-body uh, oral motion, 
Um, again, not a high fidelity thing, but, but uh, you know, preliminary design, very useful for that. Breguet range is, an, is another one where, you know, I, I know approximately how, the, how this aircraft's going to perform here. It doesn't have to be super high fidelity, just do it fast. Um, so analytic phases are, are made to solve that. Um, there's documentation on them in the, in the current, uh, currently the released version. I encourage you to go look at it. Um, we also made them so that they do respect, you know, they, they, they follow these simple outputs as, as defined essentially by, by a, what you would consider a normal open MDO system that's providing the, uh, the, the state outputs at any given point as requested. Um, but they do follow, uh, you know, boundary constraints and path constraints and phase linkages as, as requested. And then, let's see, future development efforts. Restart improvements. Um, Dimos methods work best with good initial guesses, and my colleagues don't like to hear this because they want some, they, uh, people want something where you know I don't have to mess with it. That's difficult to do, especially in trajectory optimization, where you know I have a lot of variables, and and it would sure help a lot if I could you know give the optimizer a, a good initial uh, start to, from which to explore the design space. Um, so some of the ways we do this are we take a, a previous solution and say, you know, load in, load in this, res, uh, this uh, case recorder file from this previous solution that OpenMDO generates and start from there. Explicit simulation is another one where I can run Dimos in explicit simulation mode and say, well, here's a physical trajectory that followed my control history. It might not go where you want it to go or follow the uh, path constraints or boundary constraints, but at least it's physical. Uh, as far as the, the pseudo-spectral methods go, that's a lot of, of uh, constraints that are satisfied and it makes the optimizer a lot uh, happier to start with a good guess like that. It's not always possible though. I mean, for complicated problems, you can't necessarily prescribe um, the, the supersonic uh, aircraft minimum time to climb is like my favorite case of all time. And it, it was basically made to demonstrate this fact that if I just guess, uh, and it bas it's, depends on how you parameterize the problem obviously, but if I guess an angle of attack history for the vehicle, it's entirely likely that the vehicle is going to end up flying straight up or straight down, um, which is not only bad, in real life, but it also destroys the derivatives and, and, the, and the equations of motion are singular at that point and it just blows up. Um, so it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to get a good initial guess um, based on a physical solution if, if you wanna do everything that way. In the past, the practice on this was often, you know, I'm going to build up my case a little bit at a time and a little bit at a time, but that's, you know, that's labor intensive and that's something that we're trying, uh, you know, finding ways to resolve uh, around now. Uh, so, currently OpenMDAO, or currently Dimos lets you pull in restart data. It doesn't work in every case. Um, you know, what if, what if my trajectory is quite complicated? What if I have a leg of a trajectory in an unrelated, uh, or a leg of a phase in an un unrelated problem, and I wanna use that to seed the initial guess in an unrelated case? That could be useful. So, um, for various reasons, I, I think we will probably look at better ways to pull data in, uh, and I'm happy to talk about this later if there are questions about it. Adaptive step shooting methods. So I, I mentioned this earlier as far as explicit shooting is concerned. There's a lot of interest in the machine learning uh, community with neural ODEs and things like that. There's good documentation for them online. Um, and they say that this is the way you do it, but whenever they demonstrate it, they demonstrate it with fixed step integrators. Um, for aircraft, that's usually fine. Uh, we can usually find small enough time steps th that are acceptable from both a speed consideration and from an accuracy consideration. On the other side of the house, when I work on spacecraft tra uh, trajectories and I wanna do a highly elliptical orbit, I either have to uh, use some other kind of, of uh, independent variable other than time, because if I'm, in a, if I'm in a large elliptical orbit, I can't take a big time step through my periapsis pass. Uh, it will be too inaccurate. Um, but then I also don't wanna suffer from small time steps when I'm way out. I'd love to be able to change the time step as I go. Um, there have been some uh, interesting uh, publications on this from the, in the past uh, decade or so of, of people saying, look, we, we think that these methods that um, things like state transition matrices and things like that where uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, to track the derivatives through that process, 
they generally ignore the fact that the time step changes and while I end up in the same place, how I got there matters as far as the derivatives are concerned. Um, and that's where, um, uh, when you, and when you use an adapt, adaptive uh, time step, uh, I have some of the equations out of the common ones here, but there's a lot of min and max functions and, and things that aren't differentiable. So for, through each step, when I'm trying to work out my derivatives through each step of this process, if I have a fixed step RK4, if I have a fixed step Euler, even then it's pretty complicated, but I can, I can work out the math and, and track those derivatives and accumulate them throughout the propagation. When I have something like those min and max functions in there, um, is that possible? And I know a lot of people say they don't see a problem with it. They're, they're, they're getting good results. I, in my experience, uh, some of the problems we've thrown at it, if, if I have a problem where the time step wants to, to change rapidly, it hasn't been good. And I don't want to stand up here with a hubris and say, like, RK methods aren't good for variable, you know, variable step methods don't work for this. That seems really, um, I, I, I don't know that I want to say, you know, we, we need different integrators, but maybe we need a different integrator that, that chooses its step size in a way that's, that's differentiable and, and possibly look at that. Training. So John's going to talk to you soon about his awesome uh, YouTube videos on practical MDO. Uh, I'm very interested in doing that for Dymos also. I, I, I'm always talking uh, with people about, okay, here's, here's ways you can improve uh, using the code. Uh, to get it to be uh, faster or more robust. So uh, boiling those lessons down uh, and, and getting them on, onto YouTube, I think would be a really good, uh, a really good practice. So um, just basically teaching people the importance of parameterization, even though the physics are the same, the parameterization that you choose mat matters for how the optimizer wants to move through the trade space. Uh, and then, you know, I will bang on, bang on the desk all day that you need to leverage sparsity because frankly, if, if you're not leveraging sparsity, Dymos does not make sense. At, at least the, the, the pseudo-spectral methods don't make sense to use. That They are based on the assumption uh, that you can leverage sparsity in your models. So, just as before, we had uh, question and answer time. Uh, if there are any Dymos users out there who have any questions, I am happy to take them now. You'll also be welcome to ask Rob questions later. We have a, we'll have about five minutes for questions for this one. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. And I have another question regarding, uh, it's a quick question. So are you planning uh, to develop eight, any HP uh, adaptive method for the pseudo-spectral uh, domain? So uh, we, we currently have both an HP and a PH method that are relatively new out of the literature. I believe they're developed, um, uh, I think they, ca they came from literature from Anil Rao's people out of uh, University of Florida. Um, they work to varying degrees of success. Some of them don't seem to ever be satisfied and just keep working infinitely. That also goes towards the um, situation I was talking about earlier of, of loading in previous data. And, and for, for simple DIMOS cases, the ones we have in our documentation where the open MDO problem is the DIMOS problem, they work really well. If I have multiple trajectories uh, involved in you know, a, a very complex model, then I, I have less faith in them. Um, and uh, in addition, if you have solvers with, with states underneath the hood and, you, and it really matters that I populate those states and interpolate those states, Dymos doesn't necessarily know that those are there. Um, sorry, in, in that case by states, I mean implicit outputs. Uh, nomenclature difference between optimal control and, and MDO. Um, but basically, if I have implicit outputs under the hood and I, and I need to change the size of that vector, and it's really important that I provide those as guesses, how do I know those need to be there? Um, I feel like that's probably an effort that we need to undertake on the open MDO side of things to say, you know, instead of using this load case functionality that's great when the size of the, of the things involved hasn't changed, if they're different, and, and this goes beyond, you know, the pseudo-spectral methods are sort of like CFD in time, right? They're a grid in time uh, for, for uh, yeah, um, CFD and other things like that, if I want to refine my grid, grid there, it's, it's just as important there. Um, 
So I, I think there's probably going to be some sort of future development effort where we say, okay, let's have each system know how to load itself in from this data that I'm giving it, rather than just kind of at the problem level saying, you get everything that I knew about before, and if it needs to be interpolated. And like I said, the one that's in Dimos right now knows about the Dimos things, the controls and the states that need to be interpolated. It does not know about other things. Um, does that answer your question? We have uh, a question from the uh, remote audience. Uh, Joel Gagnon, I hope, I hope I didn't butcher your name, I'm sorry if I did. Gagnon, any suggestions on a better approach than using constant angle of attack for initializing a trajectory? You simulate? Uh, it, it would probably be, and, and again, this is the, the old school way of doing it, uh, but in the past, like with, with the... Uh, with the min time to climb problem, if I don't know what angle of attack history to choose, I might just start out and say, just fly 10 seconds and, and get a trajectory going there and then guess that as the initial trajectory and perhaps uh, let it grow itself out. Because yeah, if, you, if, you use, if you're using constant angle of attack, um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm curious if he's using uh, the shooting methods or solve segments, because if you are, then, then the fact that you are forced to follow physics and do what, um, and do what uh, you know, your control is telling you to do, then you can get into trouble. The pseudo-spectral methods should work around that better and be able to resolve that. Okay, thanks. Uh, hey. Joel, if you have more questions on that, feel free to reach out to Rob directly via email. I'm Absolutely. Sure he'd be happy to chat on your specific case. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, in the back, Justin, corner. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, have used Dimos pretty heavily, but I've never understood what solve segments is for. Uh, or <laughs> so, great question. That's my that's my issue. But I'm kind of curious to hear it. Uh, people on the development team always confuse solve segments with solve subsystems. That's a property of a Newton solver too. Um, uh, how do I explain this? So when, when you have a single polynomial segment and you say, I'm going, I'm going to have a third order segment and I'm going to, you know, lob a cannonball and fit the X variable to, uh, you know, X's evolution in time to that polynomial segment and Y's evolution in time uh, to a polynomial segment based on those time points. Um, what the pseudospectral methods are, are effectively doing are, are looking at, you know, I've, I'm guessing a polynomial history or a polynomial uh, for what X looks like relative to time. I take the shape of it, um, and then I evaluate at certain points. I'm just going to call the ODE there, with knowing that knowing what the state's going into that and the controls going into that should be. Uh, it's the rate coming out of the ODE, the slope of you know X with respect to time out of the ODE. Is it the same as as the one that my polynomial is saying it should be there? That's effectively all the pseudospectral methods are doing. Um, classically, we give those to the optimizer and say, okay, you have to impose this as a constraint that the difference in slope between those two things has to be zero or close to zero for this trajectory to be physically valid. Um, we can also give only, like, so, so another option would be I'm just going to use a nonlinear solver, a Newton solver, and say, okay, the, the initial value there, if, you, if I want to, this would be solve segments in forward mode. My initial value is a design variable. I'm going to tell you what it is. In that third order polynomial, maybe the other three uh, values of that state variable, they're just being, they're implicit outputs being controlled by a solver. And then the solver is looking at effectively, you know, in, instead of it being an optimizer constraint, the difference in my slopes is now a residual, and the solver is, is, take, is tweaking the last three elements in that, in that uh, polynomial and saying, you know, am I, am I driving my residual to zero? So in forward mode, solve segments is basically solving the initial value problem. It's saying, I'm starting here, I'm using the machinery for the pseudo-spectral method, but I'm going to tell you, I, like, the solver is going to resolve and say, I end up here after three more steps. That's, that's what satisfies physics. Um, and you can run that in forward mode, you can run that, you can start at the end point and run it in backward, backward mode, it works, works the same. Um, so it's really just a, a matter of, do I want to hand off all of those additional constraints to the optimizer, which is what we do by default, or do I want them to be converged by a Newton solver, which suffers performance-wise, but it also means that if I just call run model and I don't have an optimizer anywhere 
involved, you, you know, I still get a physically valid time history out of that. For what it's worth, if you want to dip your toe into solve segments, I would recommend picking a problem that doesn't have uh, any controls on it to start with, because if you have like controls that give, like the problem Rob was talking about, where if you know if you had a control that caused your angle of attack to go vertical, solve segments isn't going to be able to work because it can't get across that singularity. So pick a problem that has no controls. It makes it a little easier to get solve segments working. Yeah, so solve segments is great for if you're just propagating something. If you have an actual controlled vehicle, I mean, the entire, the entire demonstration of, of the minimum time to climb problem is ba was basically to say, look how much better pseudospectral methods work than these uh, explicit shooting methods on, on an example like this. So. Any other questions? You are, of course, welcome to quiz Rob uh, through, throughout the conference on, uh, on any of these topics. There was one more quick question online, which is, you All mentioned right. a new, Newton, Newtonian solver. Are you referring to newton Rabson? Yes. The, the answer is we are using OpenMDO's built-in Newton solver, which is a version of a newton Rabson solver to converge a set of equality constraints as residuals. Um, further questions for Dimos can be directed to Rob either later today, this evening, or online. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Rob.